Thank you, Ine, for this uh, nice introduction, and thanks for inviting me here. And uh, uh, since I'm the last plenary, I'd take, like to take the opportunity to take thank the organizers of this wonderful conference. I think they deserve a big round of applause. Um, so, and, and I've particularly enjoyed the food here, but uh, I have a different kind of meal to offer, and this is the menu of the talk. As a starter, I'll give a brief introduction to constructions and constructicons. If you already know construction grammar, there will be nothing new for you here. Uh, the main course is an introduction to um, constructicon development, and I'll try to address that from the perspective of lexicography, since that's the theme of the workshop. And although my own experience is mainly from developing the Swedish constructicon, the examples will be in English. I think you would appreciate that. Uh, and if we have room for dessert, I'm not sure about that, I'll say a few words on our continuing current work to connect constructions in different languages. I'm not sure if we'll have time for that. And as you will all appreciate, regardless of whether we have dessert or not, the coffee afterwards will be more concrete. Uh, yeah. So the first part on constructions and constructicon uh, takes issue with this traditional model of language where language is a grammar and a dictionary uh, and a lexicon where grammar is typically conceived of as a system of general rules and the lexicon would then be a set of individual items. And this uh, perception is also reflected in uh, descriptive resources, so we typically describe grammar in grammar books and the lexicon in dictionaries. This is nice in a lot of ways, but the problem is what do we do with the stuff that's too general to be covered, tied to specific words, but too specific to be considered general rules? Uh, some examples of that. Uh, we have rate patterns like miles an hour, dollars a month, euros a head, times a day, times a week, and all of that. And so it, it's a, basically, a, it's math. It, it's a relation between a numerator and a denominator connected by an indefinite article for some reason. Uh, and uh, so this, I mean, the specific phrases, miles an hour, that, something you could, that's lexicalized, but the overall pattern of how you relate the denominator and the numerator is not lexical. It's, it's more general than that. You can apply it to basically any kind of rate relation. Uh, you have this, one of the first cases to be covered by construction grammar. It's called the extra the wire, like the more the merrier, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. So you have a comparative expression, or two comparative expressions related with a definite article starting each one of them. You, you can't really see the relation. Where would you put this in a dictionary? Not under the. And, and, and the other key element is that you can have, you need an adjective or two adjectives in, in the comparative form, but it could be any adjective. It, it's not general grammar, it's not lexicalized, it's somewhere in between. And, uh, or this, X as hungry as a wolf, red as a beetroot, fast as a shark. I mean, all these expressions are quite particular, but the general pattern that you can talk about anything as X as a Y, where would you treat that? Or, uh, X by X, uh, you know, step by step, day by day, piece by piece. You could probably find this under step and day and piece in a, in a good dictionary that has construction patterns in them. But you wouldn't find this one under car. The emissions were measured car by car. So, so uh, what these examples have in common is that 
A dictionary can capture the lexicalized instances of these patterns, but they cannot capture the productivity. And, and this is not just a few marginal border cases, but the more you look at what's not strictly grammar or strictly lexicon, but combining the two, the more you look at it, the, the more you find. It, it's, it's huge, it, it's a very big part of language. So for this reason, in construction grammar, we reject this sharp distinction between grammar and lexicon. And I mean, the, the difference between grammar and lexicon, it's more a continuum. You have the more general stuff here, the more specific stuff here, here but most of the patterns we have are somewhere in between. And uh, so we conceive of all of that as a constructicon. And the constructicon would then be a, a network of constructions. And a construction in this, from this perception is basically any conventional form function pairing. It could be of any level of abstraction or complexity. So you have words, idiom, clausal patterns, phrasal patterns, partially schematic structure, any linguistic pattern is basically construction. Uh, and this is different from what you typically mean by construction, outside construction grammar. In the OED, they're defined as the connection between verbs and their complements. So then constructions are basically valence patterns. And that's a kind of constructions, but from a construction grammar point of view, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, so, treating constructions as conventional pairings of form and meaning function, I mean, that's how we've been treating words for ages. So we have the form pizza and the meaning something we like to eat. And the idea with construction grammar, we can do the same thing with grammatical patterns or something combining lexical. And, and grammatical properties. So here's, for example, the so-called cost motion construction, both for very concrete motion, like Pat loaded hay on to the truck, but also things like she sneezed the foam off the cappuccino or the audience laughed the poor guy off the stage. But uh, so if we look at a form representing a kind of meaning or function, the form is you have a subject, a verb, an object, and an oblique. And the meaning of those is that the subject represents a cause that's causing a theme to move towards a goal. So it's form, meaning, just it's more abstract, but basically the same thing. So, so we can treat basically any linguistic pattern as we describe its formal properties and its content properties, and that's the construction. Uh, and they are said to form a, a network, which we call the constructicon. That's uh, the theory of it. So presumably, our linguistic knowledge is a mental constructicon. In applied practice, we would like to have some reflection of that. Uh, a reference constructicon mirroring the knowledge we have. We're working towards that, but uh, what we can claim to have so far are collections of construction descriptions. So it would be fragments of, of the whole constructicon. But even what we do have is already useful for linguistics, for uh, language technology, and it's also been used in language pedagogy. So that's what we want it for. Uh, on to the main part. So if you want to do this, how do you build one? Um, there are, of course, lots of issues, but some of the foundational issues, if you want to build a constructicon, you have to start out from the purpose. Do you intend this for NLP application 
or do you want something for human users? I think that's the big divider on, on how you would approach this. And then, it, do you want to build it as an independent resource or integrate it with other resources, typically a lexicon of some kind? Uh, since we cannot cover the whole language all at once, uh, uh, what should we focus on? And then, how do we find and identify the constructions we want to deal with? Uh, and then the dis main design, design issues, what do we call the constructions? Seems like a simple issue, but it's really not trivial at all. How would you organize the resource? How, what kind of description format do you want? And then how do you handle categorization and variation and all of that? So starting with the purpose, uh, some of the Constructicon projects out there are aiming towards NLP applications like the Brazilian Portuguese Constructicon and the work they do with fluid construction grammar. Hungarian shouldn't be there. It's based on NLP, but it's intended for, uh, for uh, human users. If you go this road, then you need precise formalized uh, representations that a computer can read. Um, basically, the opposite route would be if you design it for language education, like they do for Russian and uh, planning for Norwegian. And then the main thing is that it has to be user-friendly. So basically opposite routes here. And uh, for Swedish, we couldn't really choose. We want to do everything, I'm afraid. So we were aiming for a multi-purpose resource that can be used for linguistics and language technology and language pedagogy. Uh, so if you do that, of course, you have to do a lot of compromises. What you do cannot be ideally suited for just one of these purposes. Even if you can do a lot under the hood that's not displayed on the interface, it's still, still a lot of compromises. But one thing we do is that the actual applications aren't included in the resource per se. So, so we have links to pedagogical applications outside it and so on. And we also have two modes of representation. So um, what the user first sees is something relatively simple, but then if you want more information, you can get that by, by a simple click. Uh, this is the current interface. It's still under development. And so at the top, you have some general information about the resource, and then you have links to various external sources, including what I said before about the pedagogical applications of it. And on this side, we have a list of constructions, and here uh, is a construction description. You can't read this because it's small and it's also in Swedish, so what I basically want to show you here is that the starting point, you just get short, simple, basic information. And if you rather would choose the more extended uh, format, you get all of this. It's more technical and specialized, but some users may be interested in that. I'll, I'll show the actual content in English a bit later. Uh, but returning to the starting points, it's also whether you would have an autonomous or integrated resource. The first uh, Constructicon in Berkeley was based on the Berkeley FrameNet and, and really integrated with that and also the German, Japanese and Brazilian Portuguese Constructicons are also designed that way. So it's basically a FrameNet with a FrameNet lexicon and a FrameNet Constructicon and it's done on the terms of FrameNet. There are pros and cons with that. Uh, but then you have other starting points. You can build it from a dictionary. So in Erlangen, they, 
where they have made a valence dictionary for English. They used that material to build a constructicon and are so starting with valence patterns as constructions and then moving from there. And they basically do something similar in Birmingham using uh, uh, pattern grammar. And the Hungarian constructicon is also derived from, from a dictionary. And, but you can also just build a constructicon by itself. There is no uh, frame net for either Russian, at least not for Russian, I'm not No, I don't think there's one for Norwegian either. And uh, so, so these are, are pedagogically oriented things for teaching Russian uh, and Norwegian uh, to L2 learners. So, so they don't have, uh, they, they started out from their own teaching and their own courses and built the Constructicon from what they had need for there. Uh, again, uh, Swedish takes some kind of a, a middle position. So it, it's part of the language bank of Swedish, which is uh, an NLP resource infrastructure with a, a bit over 30 different lexical resources, a multitude of different corpora, all connected in various ways. And uh, so the Swedish Constructicon is part of that, but within it, it's a, an autonomous resource. And that's important because when we started, all the Constructicons were based on FrameNet. And there are lots of benefits with that, but the drawback is that it's, FrameNet is designed for, for uh, lexical meanings or meanings expressed by the lexicon. So there's a lexical bias to it. And we wanted to describe Swedish constructions on their own terms, not on being restricted on something that's designed for a different purpose. Then we do link the constructions we have to FrameNet afterwards. If they have a meaning corresponding to Frame, then we can make the link. But when we do the actual analysis and description, we don't want to think about FrameNet because uh, we think that it would will be more accurate that way. Um, okay. Then what constructions should we include? Um, in theory, uh, if the Constructicon is the whole language, then the Lexicon is a subset of the Constructicon. In actual practice, uh, they're usually treated as complementary because if you have good dictionaries for the language, that's not where we should uh, focus our efforts, but rather uh, cover what's not really covered by the dic dictionary. And that means that most construction entries account for patterns that has at least one variable element. If it's all fixed, then the dictionary can take care of it. Um, on focus areas, uh, most of the constructicons have started on the in-between area, partial schematics, semi-general constructions, the stuff that would be hard to cover from a purely lexical perspective or a purely grammatical perspective. It's kind of natural that we focus on the things that have been neglected before. Uh, those of us who want the Constructicon to be useful for L2 education, of course, then we have that in mind. To, to cover the stuff that's difficult for language learners. Um, those who are based on, on valence dictionaries, their natural starting point would be argument structure constructions. And then there are those of us who aim towards covering some kind of comprehensive construction network for a whole language. Uh, the Brazilians do it because they want to build a constructional parser. Uh, we do it because we want to test this idea that language is a network of constructions. 
it's been claimed for decades, but you should be able to show some proof of concept of that. So we're, we're testing if we can do that. Uh, I will tell you in hopefully a few years, possibly longer. It, it, it's a lot to cover. Uh, yeah, and then how do you identify the constructions to cover? A, a good starting point is that you usually have descriptions of some constructions in the language. So you adapt them, them to this format. And when you have them, you can expand by finding related constructions with similar meanings. And you, ha you need to distinguish one construction from the, uh, the ones around it anyway. So uh, like the circles in the water when you throw a rock or something. Uh, then there's a lot you can gain from secondary sources, like constructional information in dictionaries. And we found a lot by just looking at grammar books for, you know, the exceptions and the stuff that doesn't really fit into the general rules. You can actually gain a lot from looking there. Uh, an interesting thing is what's now called construction mining. We didn't know that, that term when we started doing it, but that's using uh, NLP tools to find construction candidates in Corpora. And some of those candidates that the, the uh, algorithm gives you is just uh, gibberish or, or meaningless, but, but you do get, it does provide a, a lot of interesting patterns. And it's particularly good at giving you the constructions that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. I mean, some, let's say, idioms, they're very striking. You can't miss them. But we have a lot of insignificant patterns that you, you use them without thinking about them. You don't notice them. But there's a lot of those that you should cover as well. Um, and then, since we wanted to find constructions that are relevant for L2 education, uh, we did that from two sides. On the one hand, we look at learner texts to see what constructions they're having problems with, and then we should cover them. And we also look at textbooks and teaching aids. Presumably, they're supposed to, uh, the students are supposed to comprehend and read those texts. And of course, there are difficulties with the vocabulary and the content and all of that, but uh, there are also, of course, grammatical constructions in there that you have to be able to process and handle in order to uh, get what's the contents of the text. So we, we looked at this from both angles and uh, uh, added uh, the constructions we identified that way. And uh, I mean, whatever you can think of. You hear something on the bus, you see an ad, I mean, there are, we're using language all the time, so there are constructions everywhere. And once you know, have your perception focused on identifying constructions, you can't help doing it all the time, really. Uh, okay, so that's for the starting points. Turning to design issues, I start with uh, how you name them. In lexicography, that's easy because you have a head word and everything is based on that. In constructography, it's uh, not that clear because this is a familiar construction. Pat, Chris gave Pat a book or Kim emailed Chris the manuscript. What would you call this construction? Double object construction? Ditransitive. I mean, you know it, but it's uh, it has different names in in, in different texts. Or uh, this one, uh, it's been called the Xer the wire, reflecting the structure, and it's also been called the comparative correlative construction. 
And these are the familiar cases. I mean, well-known constructions that have been treated in the literature. But the obscure ones that we found through construction mining, uh, if we don't know what to call them, how would a user know how to search for them? So this is really not a trivial issue. Uh, two naming principles you can use is, if there is a familiar linguistic term, you can use that, ditransitive or comparative correlative. You can also use a schematic illustration like the, the X of the wire construction, or the what's X doing Y? It's, it's things like, uh, what's this fly doing in my soup? And it's not an information question. That's why uh, the response, it's doing the backstroke, is, is a joke and not an actual response. Uh, so, so it has a form of a question, but it's rather expressing, I think Chuck Fillmore called it incredulity. Uh, and it has some fixed elements. It's also always what, it's always doing, but the X and the Y can differ. Uh, yeah, other naming principles is if there is a key element, you can use that, like the let alone construction or the way construction. The way construction is something like uh, 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 they uh, fought their way to the top or uh, something like that. So it, it's a motion construction where we have the element way, and there are different variants of that. And, or you could use a key example. Instead of what's X doing Y, you can have the fly in the soup construction. That might also work. But since it's not obvious what to choose, it's not obvious for a user either. So one way to handle that is that we combine the name with an example next to the name. So you have the adjective as nominal people construction. It's not entirely transparent, but if you see that it's phrases like the rich and the poor, so, so basically noun phrases where the head is an adjective instead of a noun, and uh, so adjective as nominal. So with the name and the example together, you might get what it is. But either way, you need other ways to find them. So you can annotate them for various keywords that user can search for. You, you can group them thematically, and you can also have network relations where you, from one construction, see what it's tied to. So some of the groupings you could have, like reflexive constructions, time expressions, compounds, causative, motion construction. I mean, any grouping that would be relevant for what you want the, the Constructicon for, or what you think that might be relevant for the, for the users. Uh, here's an example. Oh. I, okay. I thought there would be another picture there. From, from uh, naming and uh, grouping and all of that, we get to organization. Uh, what you first might think of is order them alphabetically in a list, the way you do in lexicography, where it works very nicely. It's next to useless for constructicography. If you don't know what to call a construction, then ordering them alphabetically would really make no sense. Uh, so what you can do is group them thematically, like you typically do with structures in a grammar, and uh, you need that for, for a Constructicon, but I don't think it's sufficient. You also need some kind of network structure, not only because it's in accordance with uh, constructionist theory, but also it can, it's a way of visualizing relations, and it, it's more dynamic. From any construction, you can see what it relates to. So if you don't find the exact right one, but some thing next to it, then you can move by links to get, to get what you're actually after. So, I mean, this might not be entirely easy to navigate when you see 
a big part of the network like this. But if you zoom in on a particular construction and you see what constructions does this to relate to, and you can choose which kinds of relation you want to display or not, that's when it can start to get useful. And uh, we're working on that still. Um, moving to description format, now I'll focus on the Swedish Constructicon. The, there are just too many variants to show all of them, but um, as I said before, we have two display modes. And in the basic mode, all you get is the name and example, as I showed you for this, uh, the rich and the poor kind, and a definition in prose, not just the meaning, but also of the, the structure of it, the form. A formal structure sketch, which is basically a linear representation of the construction elements, I'll show you soon, and of course, a very important part is that you have a set of annotated examples illustrating the construction. So uh, it might look like this. So the example is from the Berkeley FrameNet English Constructicon, but the format is what you get from the basic display mode for Swedish. So the name, adjective is nominal, the rich and the poor. So you have both the name and the illustration. The definition, a noun phrase denoting the generic set of people with a particular property, is formed from a definite determiner, the, and an adjective phrase that identifies that property. Uh, the structure sketch is quite simple here. You have the and an adjective phrase. So the same information that you get from the um, definition, but it's formalized. And then a few annotated examples. If you choose the extended mode, you get more information first about organization, uh, the grammatical category of the construction, what various uh, types and groups it, it belongs to, and network relations. Uh, we also have uh, feature analysis of the particular construction elements including, included in the construction, so you can have a more detailed a uh, picture of the constraints on each element in the construction. And some of them have, uh, are associated with particular lexical units, either if it's a lexically fixed element, we call those keywords, or some elements that are not fixed, but they're, let's say, common slot fillers. They tend to often occur in this construction. And so we uh, include those in the description and they're linked to the various lexical resources in the language bank. So you can get from the construction for, uh, and the keywords or the common words to the lexical description, but you can also get the other way to the construction from the lexical descriptions. Uh, that's one of the nice things when you have a lot of resources combined. Uh, and we also link to external sources if the construction has a meaning corresponding to frame, we link it to FrameNet. Since we started out in comparison to the Berkeley Constructicon, any of the Swedish constructions related to, to that would be a link. And also to Mokka, I won't have time to talk about that, I'm afraid, but that's our model for relating uh, constructions in different languages. Uh, and some comments and references as well. Uh, so you get a lot more information in the extended mode than the basic mode. Turning to categorization and variation, and starting with categorization, um, we have the same issues in constructicography as you would have in lexicography regarding polysemy and homonymy, but some of those cases get more complex because you, you have both, both formal and uh, uh, semantic variation to take into account. So here's one example. You have the cost motion construction I showed you before. Sandmi drove me to the airport and the audience left him off the stage. A motion event towards the goal. And you have a resultative construction like Chris hammered the metal flat, 
Kim drank himself silly, we have an action leading to result. But a, a result is a kind of goal, so they are closely related. And you have expressions like this, they voted him out of office, she drank him under the table, they drove me to the drink of despair. Which is it? Cost motion or resultative? I mean, you can see it as a metaf metaphoric instances of the cost motion construction, or as a resultative construction where the result is expressed by a prepositional phrase instead of an adjective phrase. So, so I mean, that's the kind of categorization issues you have to handle and in, in a hopefully uh, consistent way. But either way, this is also an example of why you need the, the network relations. So regardless of how you categorize those cases, you need some kind of connection between cost motion and resultative. Uh, turning to variation, uh, if it's variable realization of the same slot, it's fairly straightforward. So you could say that the result of a resultative could be either an adjective phrase or a prepositional phrase. But uh, when you have variation in the syntagmatic realization, it gets more... I mean, it, it's not... In itself, it's, it's not that complex. You could have, rather than wine, Americans would drink beer. Americans would drink beer rather than wine. Americans would rather drink beer than wine. So you have some variation in the word order. Uh, but it's a lot more difficult to represent this than just have a p, p, p and a slash between it. And also, as you would ha have to deal with, with any kind of uh, variation, they're not equal. I mean, usually one of the forms is the default and most common, most typical one, and the others are more marginal. So how would you handle that? Do you take only the most common case? Do you represent all the variants equally? Or do you somehow indicate that this is the typical variant and these are the less typical variants? Right. Uh, I'll leave the particular issues now and go to more overall comparison, starting to compare constructicography with construction grammar, uh, where uh, it's basically the difference between applied and theoretical linguistics. Uh, so where construction grammar is investigating human language, uh, the purpose of constructing Constructicography is to produce useful descriptions. Uh, they both, of course, aim for accuracy, but uh, uh, let's say in, in theoretical linguistics, you, you can't really compromise with accuracy. You have to be as exact and precise as you can. But for uh, constructicography, you also have to make the uh, descriptions user-friendly, which typically requires some simplification. Uh, what you would get in a typical construction grammar analysis, let's say it's a 35-page paper that you in constructicography would have in, let's say, a two or three, uh, a short entry, something that you can display, display on a screen and see all of it at once in an accessible way. And of course, it, you cannot have as much terminology and technical meta-language in constructicography. And where uh, a construction grammar analysis would have to uh, uh, live up to scientific requirements and uh, uh, theoretical, it has to fit with a th theoretically consistent uh, perception of language. What you need in constructicography, as in lexicography, is practical consistency. The, the construction entries have to look pretty much similar. A user of the resource have to uh, 
it, it, once you, you get used to the format, you should be able to recognize it when you get to new entries. So, so whatever, all of those design issues I showed you before, you can too much choose one solution in one case and another solution in another case. You have to be consistent throughout the whole resource. Uh, and that is uh, <laughs> a, lo a lot to keep track of. If we take the other perspective and compare it to lexicography, um, one obvious difference is that construction entries cannot be identified in terms of a specific headword. And a lot of the things I've been saying uh, derived from that. Then uh, there's a difference in complexity, of course, in both lexicography and constructicography, you have to handle both formal and functional variation, but uh, it's just more of it in constructicography because it's more fundamentally multidimensional. In lexicography, you usually have the word is a given, and then you handle the uh, functional variation from that and also some formal variation, but, but you have that part of form as a given starting point. In construction grammar or constructicography, you don't always have that. Uh, and you also have the kind of mismatch between the aims and the tools. Uh, I mean, both uh, lexical entries and construction entries aim for, let's say, approximate accounts of conventional usage. Th that's what we can realistically achieve. And lexicography is designed for that. I mean, so it, things like prototypes, family resemblance, and all that you would need for a good account of like, uh, meaning variation, you can do that very well in, uh, in a prose definition. But uh, when you represent grammatical information, the meta language that we have there is really designed for discrete categories. And I mean, if something is either a noun phrase or not. It can't be sort of a noun phrase or, or a verb or whatever. I mean, you, you have these very discrete distinctions between categories. And, and I mean, word order, it has to come either before or after the other word can't be, there is no middle ground in that case. So this difference is part uh, a matter of, uh, uh, let's say, the nature of the object of study and part from tradition. Uh, yeah. And tradition is really a key element here. I mean, lexicography has, has millennia of experience to build on. Whereas constructicography is a thing of the 21st century, we're just starting to learn how to do it. Yeah. And uh, I think that we'll have to skip dessert. I'm sorry, but uh, you will get coffee later and, and with food and all. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, yeah, so, um, no, yeah, sorry, this is where I'm heading. So, uh, if you want to hear about the multilingual part, the model is called MOCA, it's Model of Comparative Concepts for Constructic on Alignment and it's available at this address. And we, ha uh, we have written a few papers about it as well, if, if you want to know more. But I, uh, I guess we had a pretty full meal as it is. So let's leave some room for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Now it's time for questions and comments. Hopefully, so 
Yes. Just go back two slides, please. Uh, I guess more than two slides, since that's the part we skipped. Uh, sorry, just so, two slides. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm just moving. two from the end. So it's the comparison to construction grammar. Sorry, just two slides from the real end. Y you meant, from the very end. You meant the, the mocha concepts. Okay. So it's about, about the stuff I didn't cover. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I... Uh, I thought that is more, uh, more interesting than the lot of very critique. last. Yeah. Okay, so I guess this is it. The graph? The graph. Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, this is how mocha is supposed to work. So, so basically, here's the English Constructicon, the Swedish Constructicon, the Brazilian Portuguese Constructicon, and in between we have a set of uh, comparative concepts, and they are like basic linguistics, linguistic concepts uh, like, uh, let's say, ditransitive or, or causative or, or generic or whatever you want but defined in a language-neutral manner, based on language typology. So whenever a construction in a particular language, like the uh, English progressive participle, like I am reading, it's using a verbal copula, so it's linked to that. And it's also a deranking strategy. You go from a finite read to a non-finite reading. So you would have both of those strategies to represent the durative semantics that there's an activity ongoing. If you, in Brazilian Portuguese, you would do the same thing with a gerund, which is also using a verbal copula and a gerund form of the verb to express this meaning. In Swedish, we would have a pseudo-coordination. So instead of I am reading, you would say, I sit and read. So it's really one event, but you have two coordinated verbs. So it's also tied to durative semantics and activity ongoing. But instead of these strategies, it's linked to a coordination strategy. So that's basically how, how the multilingual model works. And... Uh, yeah, sorry it took me too long, so long to get to the right picture, but uh, yeah. that was a very brief dessert. Yes, well, more comments and questions from the... Okay, yes, yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I will not get too technical about construction mining, <laughs> But uh, just one question I wanted to ask you, what is your experience regarding construction mining and sort of the representation in various corpora? And I'm going to keep it very simple, not get into collastructional analysis and stuff like that. But uh, for instance, if you look at phrasemes, phraseological units, idioms, sometimes yeah. you get a disconnect between sort of the cognitive entrenchment and knowledge of an idiom in everyday life and yeah. then you look it up in a in a corpus and the frequency is very low so do you have experiences like that uh well yes what what we did for construction mining was not look for particular constructions mm -hmm. but what we did was uh we had hybrid engrams where each gram was annotated for both uh uh lexical item uh, and part of speech and some other properties. And, and then the algorithm would give us uh, uh, commonly uh, recurring patterns that could be like first a noun and then the preposition på, which would be on, and then it would give you an adjective. Uh, so, so a lot of those we get combinations of lexical items and grammatical categories, and then we went through the proposed hybrid engrams 
and some of them would represent, let, let's call them construction candidates, and then we had to evaluate them. If they correspond to interesting constructions, then we investigate further, further. So that's what we did. Then identifying particular constructions is a different story. We've been doing a little bit of that. I would say that the Brazilian group uh, are probably the ones who have most experience from that kind of uh, methods. Uh, so Tiago Torrent would give you a better answer on that one. Thank you. <clears throat> One more, co more, co more, more questions or comments, yes, please. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, regarding the access structure, how much uh, actual research have you done into users uh, and their use cases uh, regarding um, uh, whether and, and when and how they try to access the constructions in some other way, not through the component words, but through the construction itself. Is, is that a real use case or is that something we are just hoping to be a use case? Well, uh, we haven't done actual user studies yet. Uh, we uh, have to get further with the actual resource first. But, uh, so I, I have more of uh, anecdotal uh, reports from that quite a few teachers are actually using it and they use the construction descriptions we have and also the kinds of construction exercises that we have proposed. So, so it's, it is being used in uh, uh, L2 teaching. Uh, whether they think it works well or if they are just too polite to tell me what they don't like, I, I don't know. <laughs> And, and unfortunately, we, we can't see how many users we have. So all I know is what people have told me. Uh, we should really uh, add something so we can see how many visitors we do have. But since we're just in the process of switching from one server and interface to a different one, we, it, it's part of what we're about to build up. But yes, I would very much like to be able to get that kind of information. We're just not there yet. It, it's very, very relevant, of course. Thank you. I have one more question myself. Yeah. So just for curiosity, because we are planning something in those lines as well, how long it actually took to conceptualize the Swedish construction and what is its coverage now, and are you going to expand it? So three questions, actually. <laughs> well, well uh, the initial co conceptualization wasn't that bad. I, I, we could, th the basic idea was done in a few weeks, I guess. But uh, on the other hand, the conceptualization is still not done. We're still figuring out more and more of it. So, so it, it's more of a, a long process. And then it, you need to have a team. So, so I mean, we, we, we got funding for a few years to build the first version of the Constructicon. And then we had no funding for a while. So it was basically me doing things on my spare time. And now we got funding again to do something new. And then the way funding works is that you have to have a specific project with specific objectives that you have to be able to reach within three years or something, which is not the same thing as the gradual buildup of a, of a resource that will basically never be finished. So, so uh, I can't give a really good answer. Let's say the first three-year project got us uh, a fairly well working Constructicon with about 400 construction entries. But I mean, more work was being put into discovering the methodology and how to do this and the description format and the programming and all of that. So let's say we had had another year, we could have added tons of constructions, except that we didn't have the time and money. And then we, when we have the new funding, that's for other things. 
like, for instance, this multilingual project. So we're now building a better Constructicon, but not in the sense of adding lots of... It, the coverage is growing slower because we're focusing on, on different matters. So uh, the ones whom, who are making best progress so far would be the Brazilians and the Russians, basically because they have access to a lot of students who can continuously contribute to this project. And they have also steady funding. So, so they're not relying on particular uh, sp specific project fundings and they have to apply for it all the time. Sorry, but that's, that's the reality of the research we're doing. So it is. Yes, I think that uh, time is over. Thank, uh, we'd thank you once again, Ben, with applause. <laughs> and this is a little present. Thank you.